This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Hey guys, welcome to Epicenter. I am Meher Roy. And today I am catching up with Shiming Yang, who is one of the co founders of Orbit Markets. Orbit Markets, I think, is the market leader in the field of structured products uh, based on crypto assets. So I'm really interested to explore what this space represents and where it could go. Hi, welcome to the show, Jimmy. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. So Jimmy, tell us about your background story and how you ended up being involved in the crypto space. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, actually, I think I, I came to crypto relatively late compared to most people, I think. Uh, so we started actually in 2020, end of 2021, the beginning of 2022. So about about two years ago, actually, it's been two years. I didn't realize it's time time flies. Um, and before crypto, I, I was working uh, in traditional finance. So I worked in at, at investment banks uh, for the all of my career before. So bef uh, I was at, uh, I started my career in London with BNP Paribas and then I worked at Deutsche Bank for over uh, 12 years, uh, trading FX, currencies, derivatives. And before leaving Deutsche Bank, I was running the FX derivatives trading business uh, for APAC. So uh, what does it mean to lead the FX derivatives trading business? What is the FX derivatives trading business at an investment bank? Yeah, sure. So at the investment banks, you have, uh, well, investment bank is a very broad term, right? So everybody here is like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, Do these are the investment banks. They have one side of the business, which consists of um, merger acquisition, getting the company listed. You know, that's like the uh, corporate finance part of things. There's the, another part. So in a sense, you can think of it like primary market. Or, or if you want, like, if you want to actually, if you're more familiar with crypto, then it's like, getting a token listed on exchange or like a, a financing, et cetera, a project. There is another side of the investment banking, which is the, what we call like secondary market. So something's already listed, it's already trading. So then you have a, a, the whole, the whole the sales and trading business that actually help clients uh, put on a trade or whether it's for hedging or whether it's for speculation or whether it's for investment. So we provide those products to the clients and the clients of investment banks can be funds, hedge funds, trading desk, high net worth individuals, companies, corporates, uh, all sorts of different clients. And then we provide these investment solutions or products to them for them to trade. 
And then, so what I do as a trader or as running as the as someone running the desk is that we have obviously a team of traders. We have quants. We have uh, also middle office, back office doing the operations. So we have actually every day we a client wants to trade a certain product, a certain or certain solutions. So we have to actually have uh, make the price. So we have to actually calculate the fair price of this product. Show it to the client if the client wants to trade then the trade is done. And then we need to start managing the risk, managing the risk of those trades. And then we obviously want to make, make money as well for the bank. So um, that's what we used to do on, a, on a, at, at the sell side, we call it sell side at, at the investment banks. So now what we do in crypto is we try to basically replicate this same sales and trading business model from traditional finance to crypto. And that's what we do, actually. So at OB Markets, we offer, uh, op mostly we are focusing on options and derivatives. So we offer derivatives, products, and solutions to our clients. Uh, some of them, for example, use our structured products to hedge their uh, crypto holdings. So for example, a miner that they keep producing, uh, BTC, right, every day. And then they actually want to hedge the, the risk of price falling or fluctuations. So we customize and and make bespoke structures uh, for them. Well, we also have some of the funds who wants to actually buy tokens, accumulate certain tokens, and then we have like structure solutions to help them buy the tokens at a price that is better than the spot price. So can I think of it like as a, as a, as a crypto investor, I'm used to the idea of you know, going to an exchange and like buying this coin or that coin. And usually I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with the exchange or the matching algo of the exchange quite directly. But sometimes I might go to kind of like an OTC desk and to the OTC desk, there's a human on the other side and, and I essentially say, hey, that's what I have. That's what I want. Can you, can you make, the, make the trade for me? And like this, this trader on the other side um, will essentially figure out how to price it and will offer offer me a a price for an OTC price for for what I want. But then you could imagine that that OTC desk could get even more sophisticated where it no longer becomes about just selling or and buying something, but it's like, hey, I want to I I have this asset and I want to combine it with some kind of derivative and the and the combined thing uh, is 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 the trade I want, and then the OTC desk is able to do these complex combinations, and then as soon as you get into the field of complex com or combinations, it will happen that okay I will have to put some asset as collateral with that OTC desk, and so collateral management will also enter, which may not be part of just like a simple trade, so. As you imagine like this OTC desks becoming more and more complex, more and more capable, they would start to resemble what kind of an investment bank does on the trading side for its clients today. Is, is that correct way of seeing, seeing it? Yeah, absolutely. What you just described is, is, is true for crypto, but it's also very true for, crypto, uh, for traditional finance. So in traditional finance, you also have this exchange uh, market the venues and also the OTC side. The exchange is also a very, very important part of traditional finance. You have most of the stocks, for example, trading on exchanges, but it has also limitations, right? So the exchange can only list standardized the products. You have like standardized the payoff, standardized maturities, strikes, etc. But then what if I want something more customized or what if I want something more, as you said, more complex, right? So in that case, you actually, even in traditional finance, you have to go to an OTC desk. OTC desk in traditional finance are typically uh, big banks, big in, in investment banks. So you go to them for, for various reasons. One, you want to execute a large amount of trade. So if you do this on exchange, you will actually move the market probably against you, right? So you want to go to an investment bank who can actually manage this better for you, the execution for you. Or you go to, a, do, go to an investment bank because you actually want something more bespoke like not uh, available on the exchange. So something exotic or more, more complex. So you go to them and they are able to offer this to you. 
and they will manage the risk themselves. So they will rely on their quantitative models. They will rely on their, um, they will manage the, the, pro the product together with their other products. So to achieve efficiency. So at the moment in crypto is the same thing. Crypto market started with the very basic, simple products, which is spot, which exists in every financial market. And if you look at the evolution of any financial market gradually moves up in terms of sophistication and complexity. Sophisticated products, complex product doesn't mean they are necessarily better product. I'm not saying that, but they are probably, they, they, they are there to fit your particular view, your particular demand, your particular budget, etc. It just gives you more options. If you want like exchange, you can think exchange more like a fast food restaurants, go to McDonald's. You can just choose whatever you want. It's all standardized. You just buy food you want. And then if you want OTC, that is more like fine dining restaurant. You go there, you want like personalized dishes, you want to eat this and that, and they will make it like specifically for you, like, like a, they are dedicated service, a tailor, tailor made products for you, right? So in that case, you can uh, trade things that exactly as you want. For example, I think Bitcoin is going to go up uh, to 45,000 in the next few weeks, but it will not exceed 50,000, right? So then if you have this particular view, it's almost impossible to, to do this uh, using, I mean, it's impossible to do this using spot or perps or futures. And even with vanilla options, you can't achieve this if you have such a particular view, but you can do this using exotic options, right? So that we, we call like, for example, barrier options. So that trade will, you start make money if spot goes up above 45,000, but it will knock out. It will just di disappear if it spot goes above 50,000. And then you will be, you will buy this option really cheaply because it has this additional condition of knockout. So this is not something that you can buy from the exchange. So you have to go to OTC desk, which can provide this product to you. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So yeah, you can basically like, create new kinds of options that are not available on a, any public options market. And then you can also like combine these options with like trades that make, make even more sophisticated products. Could you, could you give us like some historical examples of this industry in, in the investment banking world, like examples where, um, I mean, there might be a story of somebody that did something like this and either made money or lost money and the story is well known in the industry and would give us an idea of how it works. You have some some stories like that. Yeah, yeah, plenty of those uh, this kind of stories. And obviously a lot of people, some people made money, some people lost money. That's just like uh, in any financial market. Options itself, I think it's, uh, I think he, I, I, I can't remember when it was invented, but it was invented probably late, like 70s or in the 80s in the in the US stock market, then there's this famous like Black Scholes formula as um, got invented. And then suddenly this becomes a very, very popular product because all the banks suddenly have the tools, have the quantitative models, the price, the risk manager, and suddenly it becomes really popular. And now if I, 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 if I remember correctly, last year, there was a big boom in the US stock market and options volume actually surpassed the volume of uh, spots stocks, right? A lot of uh, investors buying this like a zero day to mature, zero day to expiry. So basically same day expiry options to, um, to basically take like a betting now, now like a very high leverage short term betting, right? So options market grow uh, from zero to now the probably the biggest um, financial products, at least in traditional markets uh, over the last, um, I think 40 years. And then over the last 20 years, there's all this very, um, uh, all these like rapid development around even more sophisticated structured products, uh, initially all led by French, French engineering engineers with very great, like great math skills. And then they invented all the new models to price all this really sophisticated stuff. Right. So, uh, people making money from these products. Uh, plenty of examples, uh, you have a lot of like very sophisticated hedge funds, for example, they, they trade vanilla options, but they also want to trade very specific payoff. Uh, the example I said earlier, for example, uh, you won't have this, like, for example, uh, 
you want, uh, you, you think that the underlying will go up, but you will not actually exceed a certain level. So you actually add a knockout barrier. So then the, the product becomes really cheap, right? Maybe it's only like one third or quarter of the price if you buy compared to a vanilla option, but then you achieve the same return in the end, right? So you, your return, your, your return will be four times, three times or four times uh, more if you do uh, exotic options. Um, there are also plenty of um, structured product that went well. Uh, there are many that didn't go well, but many went well as well. For example, in Switzerland, uh, there's a very popular structured product called MBRC, so multi-barrier reverse convertible. Uh, there are, every day there are like 4,000 different MBRC listed on Swiss exchange, for example. So it's a very popular product and linked to different underlines like stocks, indices, or commodities. Um, surely over, over, over the years, um, there are investors who made money, but also there are times where, you know, the underlines went down and then investors lost money. Uh, I think structured products, they, they, they don't mean that they will help you make money more often than, you know, than, than simple products. That, that's definitely not true. But also at the same time, I don't think they are necessarily more dangerous either, because in the end of the day, your, your risk is similar. Your risk is you are long or short on the line, right? It's just that the payoff got like changed, adjusted, tweaked. Um, so yeah, it really depends on, the, on, the, on your use case, right? Some of the companies, for example, they use some of the hedging solutions and then achieve the really good results. So they just uh, systematically hedge their uh, financial exposures or their receivables, for example, and then they definitely achieved better financial results than if they did not hedge at all. So for me, like the flagship story of the, this structured products market as an entrepreneur was, is like this story I've heard of Mark Cuban. So he's, he's like this entrepreneur that appears these days on Shark Tank or used to appear on Shark Tank. And then there was this uh, TV series called Silicon Valley. And then uh, there was a billionaire in that, uh, billionaire character in that uh, TV series called Rus Hahnemann. And that character is kind of modeled on Mark Cuban. But the Mark Cuban story was like, uh, he, he made a sort of like a million dollars or like a couple of million dollars in one startup and sold that startup in 1989 and retired like, at the age of, I don't know, 27 or 28, he was like, I'm, I'm going to retire. And then uh, 1991, the, um, he, he, he somehow comes across the HTTP web and it's too early, but he's intrigued by it. And then he, this guy starts to eventually build a business which is called broadcast.com. So in broadcast.com, what he does is, okay, it's a simple idea. It's maybe even a dumb idea. It's like, Radio on the internet, like, could you go to a website and just listen to the radio website? That's what he starts. And it starts to get some usage as the, as the 90s passed, uh, broadcast.com booms. And then um, it gets IPOs and lists on the, on the public market, I think New York Stock Exchange. And it lists, and a few days later, the dot-com bubble crosses a value of a billion dollars. <laughs> like... And it ultimately goes to like three or four billion. Mark Cuban personally becomes a billionaire in the public markets. Then, uh, then Yahoo appears, and Yahoo is like, "We want to buy Broadcast.com." And so Mark Cuban hashes out this deal with uh, deal with Yahoo. Now, in this deal, the thing is like he has to go and work for Yahoo for a while after the sale, and he gets Yahoo stock in exchange for. Uh, broadcast.com stock. He does. He gets some cash, but the majority portion is stock. And then the stock is illiquid for three years. And this is now, I think, 1999 or late 1998. And he's sitting on a billion dollars worth of Yahoo stock that's illiquid, that's booming a ton in the dot-com bubble. And Mark Cuban's like, this is going to crash. Uh, but I don't have the Yahoo shares. And so I think he goes to one of the investment banks and he actually, the investment bankers 
create a structured product specifically for him which behaves like a a collar meaning if the if the yahoo stock falls down in price below a certain price he will make in 3 years or whatever that minimum level of uh, of of price so if he if he entered into trade with a billion dollars the worst position he can get is maybe you know 950 million dollars but on the other side because this kind of insurance is being provided on the other side if the yahoo stock like doubles from a billion to like 2 billion he might only make 50 million of those so it's like so his kind of um, payoff is bounded to a range of 950 million to 1.05 billion and he does that kind of um that kind of trade and and the interesting thing is that the underlying collateral that he has is completely illiquid like is 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 like is like this yahoo stock and then the dot com bubble does collapse and mark cuban ends up looking like a genius <laughs> so so that's 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 like the first point in my life where i read that story and was like oh wow like you could if you have like some asset in which there's constraints or you have an interesting view about the future like x will happen but not y then you could convert that view into a a trade in the in the markets essentially that's what like the structured products allow yeah so what you mentioned like a collar is a very popular structure obviously using uh vanilla simple vanilla options a very simple combination of vanilla options you buy you sell a call to cap your upside at the same time you buy a put to protect your downside right which is a uh, very very popular for this type of uh, hedging purposes uh what in, in your particular case obviously i i'm not very familiar with this uh, story i don't know depending on the exact agreement he had with yahoo like he may or may not be actually allowed to do this while well, uh, you know like in, in most of the these days like investment agreement or like merger and acquisitions when you uh when you you get the shares or you get some equities in a different company and then there's usually a vesting schedule right and then before your shares actually got are vested you uh you can't you're not allowed to hedge it as in you are not allowed to short it sell it in any form so so i'm not very sure about the exact agreement he had with yahoo uh but then these days these kind of things are especially in traditional finance i think it's a uh, uh people like check it very uh closely yeah 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 so i'm just checking the internet like this story is genuine he hedged 1.4 billion in yahoo stock yeah maybe maybe he's allow he was allowed to do that but yeah i think usually when your 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 shares are locked when your all your tokens are locked they are locked for a reason right <laughs> that day and then if you start selling it through other ways uh, other means um that basically defeats defeats the purpose of locking it or or the vesting schedule so i don't know yeah but good for him good for yeah, him good he, for he, him. Like, he he managed to managed to hedge his positions very successfully and at the right timing right and i mean that's what the internet says now i don't know the details but you can find the story on the on the internet like the listeners can find it if they want to see yeah 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 so i mean so on a similar way like maybe maybe like let's kind of think of a recent crypto market event right like so i mean the recent crypto market event is kind of like okay the etf will get approved or not this bitcoin etf will get approved or not and now there's like increased speculation about whether there's be an ethereum etf or not so like yeah could you give us some examples of structured products around the um uh, around the bitcoin etf right like the kinds of kinds of exposures people could have constructed before or before the event with with orbit yeah so now there are two big things well there there were three now there are two so we have the btc etf that is already done then we have the halving coming as well then we have the eth etf news so these are the that that could be the catalyst that triggers um a next and the next leg up so we've seen actually uh, a lot of interest from our clients to uh to buy tokens uh in actually more towards the outcoins 
So the, the, the general theme that we have observed is like a lot of buy interest in large uh, layer one tokens, right? Solana obviously is a, is a star. And then we also have seen people buying uh, Cardano, Avex. The other part, the other uh, area where a lot of uh, buy interests is, is uh, the, uh, some of the L2 tokens. And uh, that's like Optimism and Arbitrum. Uh, and then we also see some of the interest in newer um, L1 tokens as well. So how, how to actually, how to position yourself actually into these events? Uh, I think one, one very classical uh, structure products is called Accumulator. So as the name says, Accumulator is actually helping you to accumulate a certain underlying. So this product is not invented for crypto, it's not specific crypto, it has existed in traditional finance for many, many years. People use it to buy shares like Tesla shares, Amazon shares. And now uh, we have actually basically replicated in crypto and then you can use the same structure to buy tokens. And it gives you a discount versus the current spot. For example, Solana spot is at 100. If you use accumulator structure, then you can buy Solana token at, for example, 75. So it's a big discount. How do we achieve the discount? It's always, there's no free lunch, right? We're not like just giving money, free money away to people. So it's achieved through uh, this engineering of the structure products. It's achieved through two things. One is this, there's a knockout, the knockout feature. So if Solana price goes up, above a certain barrier, knock, knockout barrier, then the trade will, term, will be terminated. Meaning that your gain will be limited, right? Because you, you, if the spot goes up a lot, then you stop buying. So your gain is actually limited, right? But you're, on the other side, if the spot goes down below 75, then you still have to buy and you have to actually buy more Solana at 75. So this is obviously creating an asymmetrical payoff, right? It's obviously asymmetrical. Your, your gain is limited. Your loss is actually doubled or unlimited in a way. And because of this, you get to buy the token at a big discount. Oh, okay. So this obviously has risk, right? It doesn't come without risk. So the risk is that if the price goes down a lot, you still have to buy at the same price, right? But then this, is, this strategy could be very good for those who really want to buy Solana at, if they are, you know, if they are comfortable and they are okay to buy at, uh, at the 75, then it's fine. They can, because they, they will just be buying at 75, especially for those who are, you know, ready to buy Solana at the current spot, a hundred. So why not, why not, you know, give yourself a chance to buy at 75, right? So it, it, it really depends on use case, right? So if you are purely speculative, like I'm just like gonna speculate, then maybe this product is not necessary for you. But if you have this accumulation mandate, you just have to buy. For example, you have a long, you, you run a long only fund, then this is actually a very good strategy for your fund. Right, so if like somebody has the view that Solana will be amazing, right? Like a crypto bull market is coming. It's going to go from 100 to 500. And like this, like there's 80% chance that will happen. And then there's like 20% chance that it's going to stay range bound, like between like, I don't know, 60 and 120. That's their view, right? Like, so if, if somebody is coming with that mindset, then this person could say, well, I don't believe Solana can go lower than 60. And if I need to buy more at 75, I'm willing to buy a lot more at 75. But in exchange for accepting the obligation that if it falls below 75, they will need to buy a lot more. They can, instead of buying at 100, they might be able to buy at 80 or, or 85 or however the contract is, is structured. So essentially, because this individual has a an individual or even firm, this could be an entire firm. It could be a central bank for, for for all that matters, right? Like because there's a certain view that the odds of Solana falling to less than 60 in the next X or Y months is is very low because they have that view. They can sort of like monetize that view 
or try to monetize that view in the form of like this kind of structure. Like that's the that's the essential idea. Yeah. So I think the idea of structured products is really that you can you can do trade that exactly fits your precise views. For example, just now your view is that Solana price will stay around here. You will not really fall massively below 75. It may stay here. Then that's perfect. You just keep buying at 75 through the structure. So most of our clients who traded accumulator last year all performed very well, right? Because the spot is going up gradually, slowly, and then they just keep accumulating at the, at the discount. If your view is that Solana will jump to 500 next month, that's fine. There's, there, there, there will be a different product for you, right? So we've seen clients buying a very low delta option. So you can buy basically a one month, maybe 200 strike Solana calls for, for virtually nothing. Like maybe just, you know, like a, a few, like maybe a few basis points, a very small price. And then uh, if you're right, then you can make a huge return, right? But obviously the chance, the likelihood of you uh, winning is also very low. Right, but if you have like a really strong view that this token will just shoot to the moon next month, then you can also you you should also try options because if you buy options, you will only spend a very tiny amount of premium because you, this this option will be like super cheap because the core strike is very very far away, and then if you are wrong, you just lose you know the premium which is very cheap. But if you are right, you can get huge profit. You if you do this using um, using curbs or using futures, you have a lot of risk, right? What if it doesn't go up and if it goes down, then you will lose a lot of money, right? So I think that's where options actually be, uh, comes in quite uh, useful for some of the investors with very specific market views. So previously in this call, you mentioned like the case of like miners being being users. And could you like give an example of how cryptocurrency miners could could be users of Orbit products? Sure, like uh, we, we have clients for, some of the clients are even listed, uh, miners, uh, and then they, it, it, again, the idea of hedging like for miners is uh, actually also from inspired from traditional finance. In traditional finance, you have like the oil producer, you have the gold miners, they also have this exact demand for hedging their production or their inventory of oil or gold. So in, we basically used very say, similar uh, structures for the miners. They can use like very simple structure as you actually earlier mentioned, like a color. You can sell a call option on Bitcoin price and then you buy a put, right? And this way you are, you know, like you, your, your risk is actually uh, limited within this range, right? Because your upside is kept you are giving up some of your upside gains. But at the same time, you are, you are protected on the downside as well. This is a very simple structure, obviously. But then we also have other type of structures that helps miners actually sell their tokens on a regular basis at a price that is better than the, than the spot price. Right? So, um, for example, one of the products called Target Redemption Forward, which is from traditional finance, where you can actually sell your, for example, right now, the, the Bitcoin at 42,000, you can sell uh, Bitcoin at, let's say 47,000. Every week you can sell 47,000. And then if, if the spot is below 47,000, you sell at 47,000. If it's above, you still have to sell at 47,000. And then you just count the number of times where you make money. So, so if this week is below 47,000, you count one time, and then the next week, if it's below 47, then you count two, two times. And then when this count reach, let's say five times, this trade will terminate. So basically, if the, if the spot stays at 42,000 every week for the next five weeks, then you just keep selling at 47,000 and then the trade will expire. The trade will, it will terminate, right? But then if the spot goes above 47,000, the count will not accrue because the count will stop. You count only if it's below, right? So it will not stop. And then you will still have to sell at 47,000. So all these structured products in a way is trying to create an asymmetric uh, payoff, right? And then because if you, you accept this asymmetric payoff, then you will be compensated with a better strike than the current spot. 
so in this bitcoin case it's almost like if the market is kind of range bound like going up going down and it like and it's it's crossing the 47 barrier many times that's the case that might be bad all these type of trades right your view has to be have you need to have a bit of range bound view you need to think that the spot will stay around here you can go up a bit you can go down a bit that's fine but then if your view is that spot will let's say if your view is that bitcoin will go to 100,000 next next month then obviously you shouldn't hedge you shouldn't do any hedge right you should just hold long and then you should probably increase your long position right and if you but if your view is that it will stay in this range around the like below 47,000 uh, up and down slightly then then that's yeah then these products can be useful so there's there's no like there's no product that will you know be the perfect product that will that guarantee to make you money that doesn't exist so you always need to have your views so we 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 have like minus clients who you know have a good sense of the market you know they 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 put on some hedges uh when they think the market is like topish so then uh for example before the ETF news right their their clients uh, selling uh, bitcoins uh, back then like that then yeah all these trades went pretty well because now the bitcoin price has come off right so on your website i saw a a product that that felt really cool which is kind of like the uh hedging uniswap v3 impermanent loss right so maybe to provide some background uh, when you provide liquidity to Uniswap pools, or maybe not just Uniswap, but similar mechanisms like Joe or Trader Joe's or Avalanche or something, like that, AMM, then uh, then there are these cases in which. So the essential idea is if I'm if I'm supplying two assets, ETH and USD, my best case is that ETH does not move against the USD. The more these assets move against each other the worse my performance could be compared to like maybe just holding uh, those pair of assets 50-50 or something like that. And so like the quantification of how much worse my position is in a in an AMM compared to what would ha- would uh, what I would have achieved just by holding them 50-50 is like this called this impermanent loss. And and you have a product to hedge that, like so. Could you explain how it how it works? Yeah. So uh, as you just explained, so uh, Uniswap or this like yield farming was really popular, right? In yeah, in twenty, especially in twenty twenty two or last year, still a little bit. Uh, but the, the, all the liquidity providers they face a big problem, right? So initially they just look at the yield, but then they realize there's a there's a cost. The cost is actually in public loss, right? So you basically have an equation. On one side, you earn the fees from the protocol, from Uniswap. On the other side, you will lose uh, impermanent loss. So how do you actually hedge it? So the impermanent loss, as you said, is actually, at least for Uniswap, is deterministic. There's a formula. There's actually a, a deterministic mathematical formula that calculates the impermanent loss. If you know the initial spot level, and the final spot level, then you know exactly how much is the impermanent loss, right? So for us, we actually, when we start to look at it, we realize this, this is deterministic. So it's actually just an option or derivative in a way. It's not a normal derivative, but it is an exotic derivative with a very special formula. But in the end of the day, is a formula, the payoff, is depending only on the final price and the initial price. So we, we by that time, we did build our model to, you know, like run all the Monte Carlo simulations and then, you know, so that we can actually price uh, any payoff. So not just like the regular European value option payoff or the futures payoff, we can price any payoff. You, you write me a math formula that depends on the final uh, price. I can actually calculate the expected value of that formula as of today, right? So then in the end, we, we realized that, okay, it's nothing but just exotic for, exotic option. So then we actually can price this option, offer it to clients, and then we have the theoretical value of this option. So the clients basically, they can pay us an upfront premium, let's say 1%, is a known fixed 
cost, 1%. And then at the end, we will reimburse these clients the actual, the actual input loss. And how do we hedge it, right? We, we obviously not just taking the, the other side and do nothing. That uh, is not what we do. So we actually have to hedge it. So we hedge it as if it was an option, right? It is actually an option. So we will decompose the risk into the, from the grids, right? The delta, vega, and the, all these risks. And then we will hedge this risk accordingly using perps, the options, et cetera. So we, we have this basically a very quantitative and scientific framework for us to decompose the input and loss risk and then to hedge it uh, in the market. Yeah, that's really cool. So uh, the essential thing is if somebody wants to provision liquidity to a pool and they expect the fees that they earn from provisioning liquidity are going to be high, higher than probably like the market expects, and they're willing to give us some of the uh, give up some of these fees in order to protect against the impermanent loss. So if you have a pool where the essential structure of it is, is there's two assets, you expect volatility between those two assets, right? Like you expect one of those assets to move quite a lot against the other asset. So there's underlying volatility, but you also expect a lot of fees to occur. Then probably for such a user, it's like giving up some portion of that fee income or maybe all of that fee income in order to protect against that volatility is kind of what your engineering allows. Exactly. So. These two things are usually correlated, so which means this is very interesting, right? So if a pool is generating a lot of fees, usually the underlying asset, the underlying pair is also a very volatile pair, right? So, so and, and in the end of the day, uh, there's no free lunch, as I said earlier, right? So you, 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 on one side, you have the expected uh, fees. So you, you kind of do a research, you do estimation, you, you kind of, okay, I expect to receive maybe 15% annualized fee from this pool. And then on the other hand, I'm willing to maybe buy protection. But then obviously the, the price of the protection needs to make sense, right? If like the protection costs 20% annualized, then it doesn't make sense. So maybe the price is 7%. Okay, then I buy the protection and then I'm left with 8% almost risk-free returns, right? So this sounds like too good to be true, which again, it is too good to be true because over time, I think Uniswap, even though the Uniswap liquidity provision is a completely separate supply demand system, ecosystem on its own. On the other hand, when we price the protection, we are not looking at Uniswap at all, right? We're not looking at Uniswap, the size of the pool, the supply demand. We are only using one parameter, which is the implied volatility. And the implied volatility is decided by uh, exchange, for example, Deribit. So Deribit trades options, which has the implied volatility. So we are talking about two separate, completely separate supply and demand markets and systems. But surprisingly, over time, these two markets are converging, which means that initially, if you expect to earn a lot of fees from Uniswap, and then you buy a protection from us, which is based on Deribit implied vol, initially, let's say you, you expect there is a bit of difference between the two and then you can make money, like you, can, you are left with the risk-free returns. But over time, this return will actually, is actually disappearing, or at least on a probabilist, probabilistic basis, on the average, right? Maybe on one trade, you can still make money, but on average, you probably end up with no, no, uh, no return or no expected return at least which means that the market is actually getting efficient, right? It's getting efficient. Yeah, so yeah, I think in the end of the day, a lot of the funds who run this uh, liquidity provision or yield farming strategy realize that it's actually very hard actually to make money if you're just looking at the fees. Because in the end, in the end of the day, your fees and the impermanent loss will just be the same on average in the end, or maybe you are left with a risk, risk free rate. Like if you are talking about dollars, you are left, you make 5%, but you're not making more than that. You're not making extra performance compared to that. And so I think that these overall yield farming strategies have become less popular over the last one or two years. And especially when the funding rate of dollar itself has gone up so much, 
right? If you do nothing, you just lend dollar, you will probably get uh, 10, 15, 20%, right? So why bother doing all this yield farming and then you still have to take the impermanent loss? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So actually, like my curiosity is kind of, in all of these examples that we have taken, right, like, uh, it might start from actually the Mark Cuban example, but it could also be the accumulator or the TARP or this liquidity provisioning example. In a sense, when I look at the contract between like one of your clients and Orbit, um, the underlying is the price of some asset, right? It's the price of some asset against some, some reference asset. Could the underlying be the occurrence of an event? Like, could the underlying be, for example, a bridge will get hacked? It's a binary event, or an ETF will get approved. And could the can you do create, yeah, uh, derivatives or structures based on like events, not prices, or is that the role of a prediction market, not of structured products? I mean, what you mentioned, what you described is like a. Uh buying a lottery, right, or, or, or prediction or something like that, yeah. I mean, theoretically, it's all possible, but we need a primary market of the underlying asset first, right? So when we do the accumulate, or when we all do a TAF, or do all these like barrier options, we need to be able to hedge the primary risk, which is the directional, the underlying directional risk. When you say, uh, I want to run this, like whether ETH, uh, ETF will be approved, um, I have nothing to use to hedge my risk apart from taking, your, taking the other side of you, right? But, uh, but if we can, like some of the like a betting house, right? They can still run this because they try to adjust the, the, the ratio, the odds, right? To match both sides. Right, they are not taking any risk. Right, they are just like a match uh, the two sides, so it's very different. So for us, we still need to have um, markets where we can hedge the underlying assets. So for if, for example, if you have underlying, if you have a market where people start to trade um, the all of ETH ETF getting approved, then we can create options and structured products on top of that. But we still need to have a market where we can hedge our risk first. So that means like if you had highly liquid prediction markets on crypto for these events, then you could do like these fancy options on top and... We could, yeah, yeah, we could. But the yeah, constraint yeah. is more that those highly liquid prediction markets don't exist today. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So so right now, I think those prediction markets or prediction uh, products, I think is still more the job of the like the betting, betting house. Right, rather than the trading desk. So at the start of this interview, you mentioned that you kind of like entered the crypto space in the last two years and you founded Orbit, um, co-founded Orbit in the last two years. And I think like that's an interesting time, right? Um, because in this time, first Terra went bust, but then kind of like this Genesis went bust. And this genesis was uh, was a huge uh, was a huge event because people actually took counterparty risk against genesis. Like when I hold ETH, there is ideally no counterparty. But in the case of genesis products, genesis used to be the counterparty, and this huge counterparty went bust. And you were also doing a business in which, like in many of these products, Orbit is a counterparty. So how was that period like when the market was scared of counterparty risk and yet you were building a business that was based on counterparty risk? Yeah, I think the market is still scared of counterparty risk, which is good. I think at the beginning of crypto market, people don't are not really aware of this risk, but now people are very aware of this risk and we are also very aware of this, this risk. There are many ways to mitigate this risk. For example, we have signed ESDA which is a, the framework of traditional finance managing the counterparty credit risk. And so we have actually signed this with many of our counterparties, right? So, because um, 
then we actually just manage this da daily uh, margin uh, and the uh, collaterals. That, I mean, that still doesn't remove the counterparty risk completely, but it actually mitigates the risk significantly because your exposure is very limited to mostly just your initial margin and also some of the gap risk during the day. But otherwise, your exposure is collateralized with the, with the collateral, right? So that's what traditional finance use, the framework that traditional finance has adopted to manage the counterparty risk. Traditional finance also learned it after the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis. I mean, it existed before, but it is really after Lehman and uh, the great financial crisis that traditional banks started to be, become more aware of this and then set up all these uh, credit risk desk within the bank. So same. So we're doing this in crypto. We also use this multi-sig wallet solution with some of our counterparties, right? In traditional finance, you would actually use a third-party custodian bank to, to do this for you, right? So to sit between the two counterparties and, and then people basically send and receive money to and from this custodian. So in crypto, we have actually an innovative solution a crypto-based innovative solution to solve this problem. So instead of actually involving a third party, there are third parties obviously in, uh, in crypto as well, but they are just not financially as strong, as strong as a real custodian in traditional finance, right? Some of the custodians. So instead of actually having to take their credit risk, why not just to set up a framework between the two counterparties directly using the crypto solution. So for example, we use this multi-sig wallet. So we give, for example, four total four keys, two keys on each side. And then for each transfer in and out, we need, sorry, each transfer out, in you don't need approvals, but to transfer out of this wallet, you need, let's say three out of four keys to enable this transfer, right? So in this case, we only need to actually agree between the two quarter parties and we don't, neither party needs to give the money to a third party. And then in that case, both party will be exposed to the credit risk of that third party, right? I mean, if that third party was JP Morgan, I'm probably fine. But in crypto, there's no JP Morgan. There's no, you know, there's no like big banks with trillions of assets. So I, I, I don't necessarily trust a third party more than I trust my counterparty directly, right? So then we actually uh, use these solutions with many of our counterparties that, again, greatly reduced the counterparty concerns. And this is something that is actually didn't exist in traditional finance. And I think this is a great thing. I mean, traditional finance, maybe one day will actually also use this to save, I don't know, millions of costs of using a third party custodian. Because that third party custodian doesn't do much more than just, you know, uh, sending the money you sent to me to the other party or return the money back to you. And, you know, so this is something that you can do yourself. That's that's really interesting, right? Like, yeah, like somebody like you that's coming in from Deutsche Bank, maybe this was not the first thing you started off with, but you're like, okay, actually smart contracts can provide utility in removing the custodian and maybe saving you the 40 or 50 basis points on a particular trade and Maybe on a single trade, that's not so big, but then added across all of your clients, that might end up kind of in increasing your gross margin of your business. That's interesting. Absolutely, yeah. So using like this kind of like smart contract collateral management systems, um, you can address some forms of counterparty risk, but not all of them. Would that be accurate? Absolutely. I, I, I think that is impossible to remove counterparty risk completely. You do, a tr you do a transaction with someone, you have to accept some level of counterparty risk. So you mitigate the risk by doing due diligence at the beginning. You need to know your counterparty, right? So then, and then you have different ways to mitigate the risk, but there's no way, I don't think at this stage, there's no way to completely remove it without sacrificing efficiency. There obviously there there are ways to to remove it completely, but then you will lose uh, other things like efficiency. You have to be fully collateralized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then if the whole financial system runs that way, if everything has to be fully collateralized in financial system, 
the financial system doesn't work, right? There's no efficiency anymore. Yeah, nothing will, will really happen and nothing will move forward. So often in crypto, at least I come across this mindset that like people want to build protocols for for financial products, right? Like in a sense, maybe the classic example is actually Bitcoin, where it's like there's a, there's a thing the central bank does, and Satoshi's question was almost like, can just can you just replace that with an algorithm? And yes, you can, but but then, of course, there has to be a new asset and it has to build liquidity. And and it's possible, right? But often, like, you see, like, DeFi asking that question often, right? Like, so, um, overnight borrowing markets, can you do that? And then uh, Robert Leshner asks that question and then comes up with Compound where it's like, okay, it, he algorithmizes uh, overnight borrowing, overnight lending, Part of it probably, and then that's that's compound. So, what do you think? Like in this in this structured products market, are there parts of it that can be protocolized like that, or does it necessarily have to be a human on the other side? Because like structuring is hard, and there is always going to be counterparty risk. So, do you think protocolization of of the market you are in is is possible, or is it intrinsically not possible? I think it's possible. I think it's possible, but it's very far from the current stage. I think we are still far from there. It's possible. I think the problem, uh, we, we obviously uh, work with some of the DeFi applications, or, and also I did some research myself. I think the, the, the few issues I think with the DeFi uh, applications right now, first of all, I think it's the the efficiency. I think the, the, the capital efficiency generally is pretty poor right the traditional financial uh, traditional financial industries thrives because of all this capital efficiency you have the custodian you have prime brokers you have all the banks facilitating you know lending borrowing etc you can rehabilitate the assets so it creates a really efficient market here to ensure security and safety everything is fully collateralized etc and then this just is not really viable in the long term so to solve this problem we need i would say we need a very integrated and broad framework for all the DeFi applications so that you know we can actually integrate not just the one DeFi on its own but the DeFi's can integrate and be connected with each other and also with exchanges so that your capital can be reused rehappled you know across different venues but this I just don't see how this is happening anytime soon, unless some someone is leading this effort to create a big platform where all the DeFi applications get on this platform, including exchanges, including you know other institutions. This is number one. Number two is I think the user experience is still pretty bad these days with most of the DeFi app, definitely not designed or built for institutional. Uh, players, they may be okay for retail, but for institutions, like sometimes, like yeah, we we just don't think that is good enough or usable at all for our, for our purposes, right? Um, for example, some of the protocols we make a simple trade or transfers, we need so many different approvals, and then like it's just it's just crazy. And then if it's one retail guy, it's fine; he just approve for himself. But as an institution, we have our own approval policies and processes. So it becomes really bad. The third one, and also the most important one, I think is the hack risk. So the smart contract risk and hack risk. So this is the biggest problem, right? I think um, even well-established protocols can still get hacked. So let alone some new app, new protocols. So we, we can't really be comfortable enough to put our company's money in, a, for example, a new protocol. Uh, what if it get hacked, right? So I think, I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to this question. I think the second one probably is probably, probably the easiest to solve, but then the hack risk, the smart contract risk is kind of inherent to this DeFi uh, growth, right? 
I hope like one day there will be better technology, better ways to ensure that smart contracts are safe. What's what's really interesting as a as a technologist here is when Ethereum was being built, um, there were like I, groups of dissenting technologists that were like, we should build smart contracts differently, such such that you know the properties of smart contracts can be mathematically proven, and and it actually it is possible to build such systems, but they lost out to kind of like this. Ethereum stack and the solidity where this is kind of hard. But maybe they actually, now that smart contracts are proliferating more and more, we would have those kind of ultra secure, mathematically proven systems uh, come to fruition someday. And, and maybe actually for the real trillions of dollars of institutional money to come in and do fancy things with kind of smart contracts, maybe like that high level of quality assurance is just needed and our industry doesn't have that at, at, at this stage. I mean, we kind of pointed out like this, that even for you, kind of like, okay, using smart contracts, um, the way you do structured products in crypto is different from the way Deutsche Bank would do structured products with its clients and you're using smart contracts uh, underneath. Um, what, what are other such differences that that exist in your in in your industry in like the TradFi side of it and the crypto side of it. Like, are there other large differences in the operating environment? I think the the business model is essentially the same, right? The business model, and then also in terms of financial products are also similar. We do have a few like crypto specific crypto specific products like the IL protection, for example, but. Overall, largely, uh, they are the same. Um, in terms of pricing, quantitative models, I would say is also quite similar. The difference is uh, here we try to combine uh, the best practice of financial industry and what crypto or blockchain has to offer. For example, uh, in traditional finance, things settle uh, key plus two, so two days later, right? But in crypto, like you can settle anytime. So we, for example, for all our clients and counterparties, we settle almost instantaneously, right? So, uh, and then we also have this, um, the margin system, the collateral system that runs 24 seven because the crypto market is 24 seven. So that actually uh, greatly reduced the counterparty risk as well, because in traditional finance, you send the margin call, you have to wait the next day or sometimes, and then you wait another two days for them to send the fiat currencies through the banking system to hit your account. So you're actually exposed for like two days or, or, or more. Whereas here we do it instantaneously. We send the, we send the valuation or margin report uh, immediately and then we can actually exchange the card immediately. So that actually reduced the counterparty risk a lot. Something that, uh, something for traditional finance to actually also uh, follow, I think, in the in the in the future, right? Um, and then you mentioned smart contracts. We also use some of the smart contract solutions to manage collateral, for example. And then I think what is uh, more, I think, uh, if we you're asking about the difference, fundamental difference, I think, um, in crypto, uh, in, in in traditional banks, we emphasize a lot on risk cultures, compliance, and ethics. I still think this is quite important. Like we saw how many things went wrong in crypto over the last two years and how many people uh, went to jail, right? So I think uh, what is really good at investment banks is really emphasize these things. We have like compliance training every other week. So this is kind of after working in traditional banks for over like 14 years, I have this like in my genes already. So we actually really focus on this. I think it's good. It's good in the long term. We've seen that uh, the, the the industry is changing uh, slowly towards this. People are becoming more aware of compliance and risks and and ethics. So I think that's uh, some encouraging changes that we have seen. So beyond Orbit, um, any other interesting startups or projects in the in the structured products or yeah. Uh, the derivative space in, in the crypto industry? Well, I, I, I can't really speak 
uh, a lot about like other uh, outside options or structured derivatives. Uh, so focusing on this, I think uh, it's good that a lot of exchanges are promoting altcoin options. So initially we've seen uh, there was there's only like BTC and ETH vanilla options for a very long time. And now many exchanges, new and the existing exchanges are launching altcoin options. I think that's very good because we've definitely seen a lot of interest in altcoin uh, options. We've also seen exchanges launching structured products as well. So it's all very encouraging. Uh, I think it's great that people push, uh, promote these products together. Um, it's a big pie thing. Just We just grow the pie, the size of the pie bigger. And um, and then uh, there's, there, there'll be plenty of opportunities. Yeah. So if you look at, for example, the trading volume, uh, spot and perps and futures, have all uh, shrunk over the last two years from the peak, whereas uh, the, only the option market is like the the only that bright spot and op the the volume keeps going up, which shouldn't come as a surprise because this is just exactly the same path as uh, traditional markets uh, took. Cool. Um, yeah, it was great to talk to you, Jimmy. Any last comments, or would you like to tell your, our listeners like? how they could find you if uh, if they are interested. Yeah, sure. I think uh, if you can just maybe add add a link to our website uh, or our, our, our yeah Telegram group, something uh, after this. And yeah, uh, happy to share more like about options. And then I think uh, this is still the early stage of this option markets in crypto. Yeah. Cool. And wishing you loads of success in hopefully a bull market to come. We did it. Thank you very much.